My name is Matt Wolf. I'm the lead pastor here, and I'm so excited that you're here. Here at Stapleton Church, we are all about helping people follow Jesus. Part of that means we care about our students, our teenagers, and our goal is to make lifelong followers of Jesus. And, and through that, we have a new student ministry director that I want to introduce you, Sawyer Trapp and his wife, Sarah. So could you give them a warm welcome? We're so excited. Sawyer came this last Wednesday night and, and taught Turbulence, our youth group. Every Wednesday night they meet, and it was awesome. Did an excellent job, and we had a great turnout. A lot of students, but a lot of parents and leaders, and also some just people from our church were like, hey, I want to hear this guy meet him. So I'm glad that you guys came. And I, Sawyer, do you want to say a few words? Yeah, sure. Uh, first off, I just want to say thank you already. Um, you've welcomed Sarah and I with open arms. We feel already a part of this community and just so excited what God's going to do through us and the uh, Turbulent Student Ministry. Um, this will be one of many plugs, but if you have any interest in helping with students, <laughs> helping with food, helping with whatever, I would love to talk to you and meet you. And even if you don't, I would still love to talk to you and meet you. Um, so we're just really excited to be here, and uh, thank you. All right, thanks, Sawyer. Can we give him another round of applause? All right, well, I'm so excited about that. Big things, cool things are happening here at our church, and we are jumping into the second week in our series, Love Your Neighborhood. Love Your Neighborhood. I know that might sound a little funny, but it's an old, like a spin on the old command we've all heard so many times, love your neighbor. And that's what we're talking about in this series. If you missed last week, our first week in the series, you can jump online, stapletonchurch.com. Under our media tab, we have the audio and video available every single week. You can subscribe on YouTube for you YouTubers, and for those of you who are podcasters, you can subscribe and make sure you get that every single week, because I know some of you travel or are busy, and that way you can make sure you have the message, because that really helps, especially in a series like this, when we're talking about what can we do to impact those that are around us, what can we do as a church, what we can do as individuals, and I really want you to hear all three messages in this series. So go back and listen to last week's, listen to this one today, you guys are here, you should listen still, yeah. And then you can come back next week or catch that online as well. So we're going to be in the book of Jeremiah today. If you have a Bible, go ahead and flip there. Look on your smartphones. We're going to be Jer Jeremiah chapter 29. I know you guys know a verse from Jeremiah 29. Does anybody in here have Jeremiah 29, 11 memorized? If you do, could you just say it? I saw a few hands. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Amazing verse, right? Powerful verse. Who in here is that their favorite verse? Anybody? Yeah, there's a few. There's a few in the first service. You know, it's such a popular verse, an awesome verse, powerful one. God has plans for our lives. Amazing. We love that. Incredible truth. But most of us don't know where that verse comes from. <laughs> And that's what we're going to talk about today. This chapter, we're really going to look at the beginning of this chapter because it's going to give us some context. And I think it's going to make that verse even more powerful for you in your lives. And some of you are going to leave today. We're not covering that verse today, but you'll leave it and like, now I get why that was so important for the people at that time and why it's so important for me as well. So we're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 29, planted in Babylon, because sometimes we get put in a situation where we don't want to be. Anybody been there? In the situation you don't want to be, you're living in the place you don't want to be, you're in the job, you're like, uh, uh, this isn't even the career I want, this isn't the situation I want, this isn't even the relationship I want, these people around me, I can't even stand, and here I am. Been there? I think we all have been. Who's there right now? Yeah, a few of you, okay, yeah, maybe a few of you are afraid, afraid to raise your hand. But we've all been there in our lives where we're not where we want to be, in a bad situation, in a bad uh, job, whatever. I spoke with a young man this week, and he felt this way, and he was really struggling. He said, you know, sometimes I just feel like I'm just taking up space, like I'm just here. I, I'm just taking up oxygen, like I don't know the purpose, I don't know why I'm here, I don't know, I'm just working some random job. And, and sometimes we feel that way. What's the point? And I think there's something deep in our heart that longs to say, like, why am I here? Why am I here? What's the point of it all? And today that's what we're going to talk about, because sometimes when we're in those bad situations... We wonder why. Why am I here? And what we're going to learn through our passage today is to bloom where God plants you, even if it's in Babylon. Okay, this is what we're going to talk about today. I know you've heard that phrase before, but we're going to kind of put a, a biblical spin on it. Bloom where God plants you, even if it's in Babylon, because God's people, as we're going to find in Jeremiah 29, were not where they wanted to be. They weren't. 
So that's what I want to give you a little bit of background. So Jeremiah 29 comes at a time where God's people, the Israelites, the Jews, were not living in Israel. In fact, in I think, 605 BC, in came this huge empire, the Babylonian Empire. Huge armies, very powerful, and they were led by this evil emperor dictator named Nebuchadnezzar. And he came in and led his armies, and they took over Jerusalem, and they captured the entire land of God's people, and took those people and moved them out of Israel. They were taken as captives. Some of the, the young daughters and young women were taken as wives of the Babylonians. They were tortured, they were killed, and they were taken from their homeland into a different foreign country where they spoke a different language, it was a different culture, it wasn't where they wanted to be. That sounds pretty bad, right? And you know, I, I thought, man, it would be so cool if we could kind of just go back and like read a journal article or, or like a diary entry from some of these people, what it was like for them. And guess what? We have that. We have it in a place in the Psalms, Psalm 139. So these Psalms were actually songs that were written, but we have this one song that is infamous would probably be the right word to kind of just show what these Israelites were feeling at the time. And I think it's going to kind of set the whole table, set the stage for this passage that we're going to look at today for why we're supposed to bloom where God plants us even in Babylon. So let's look at Psalm 137, I'm sorry, Psalm 37 together. By the rivers of Babylon, this is where they were, by the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. Zion, of course, is Jerusalem. They're remembering, thinking about it, weeping, sad, in grief. For there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy, they said. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. So they were, these people as they're grieving, mourning, sad, away from their homeland, they're saying, sing some of your songs. Sing about your God, how great he is. They're mocking them. The Babylonians were awful and evil to these people. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? Can you, can you just catch the grief and the anger and bitterness that these people felt? Why am I here, they're saying. This is not where I want to be in life. But the reason why this psalm is so infamous is because of the last two lines. Catch this. Daughter Babylon, this is in the Bible, remember, doomed to destruction, happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us, happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. Did you know that was in the Bible? Who in here is that their, that their favorite verse? No? No. No, what? Seizes your infants? This is saying, I hope somebody kills your babies. This is how much I hate you. This is what the Jews were saying. This is what God's people were feeling. Can you just feel that anger within them? They're sad, but they're also very angry. They want retribution. They want their children, their babies to be killed. Now, I bring this up because this is real feelings. This is real emotions. If you're like, why is that in the Bible? Because it's reality. This is how some people feel that some of you have felt this way about people you don't like. Your enemies. Oh, you don't have to raise your hand for that one. <laughs> but this is true emotion. The Bible isn't saying this is good necessarily. It's saying this is what happens when something awful, terrible happens in your life. You're in that situation that doesn't feel good. You don't want to be there. You feel, oh, I just want revenge. I just want vengeance. I just want to hurt that person. So anybody who does that, they're going to be happy. They're going to be blessed, what this psalm is saying. So now we're getting a little bit into the psyche of these people, right? So this is where we find the people in Jeremiah 29. So let's look in verse 1 as we kind of figure out what's going on in this chapter that we're looking at today. We start reading, This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So we're going to read this letter as it's going to start in verse 4 as we'll jump in next. But there's this letter that Jeremiah the prophet is writing down, sending to the people that was inspired by God's Holy Spirit. And they're writing this letter about this time when this situation that they're in. And it, do you see how it says that they're the surviving, those who are in exile? This was considered the exile. If you've ever studied Israelite biblical history, this is the time of the exile. This is the time when they weren't living where they were wanted to. They were exiled from the land. And that's kind of a biblical framework. If you study this through the Bible, you realize that God was actually punishing them because they weren't believing. They were sinning and they were worshiping other idols. And God said, okay, I've got to get your attention somehow. So he sent them 
in exile. And another thing is that this time period was called the Babylonian captivity. This is what Jews call it, the Babylonian captivity, because for a long time they were captives, they were exiles, they were prisoners in a land that they did not want to live in. But what I really want you to notice in verse 1 is how it starts out by saying all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile. See that? Because Nebuchadnezzar, the great emperor of Babylon, had captured these people. He led his armies, and they took them, and they moved them. This was a, a tactic so they wouldn't rebel, right? You only leave a few people there in the land so they won't rebel against the big empire. Then they're weak, and then they're stuck there within your nation. So he carried them into exile. But now we're going to jump into this letter that's so interesting in verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those that were carried into exile by Nebuchadnezzar from Jerusalem to Babylon. Is that what it said? No. God, the Lord Almighty, Yahweh Shabbat, the God of all angel armies, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile. What? I thought it said in verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar did that. Well, here's the thing. Sometimes God deliberately allows bad things to happen to his people. Now, I know this isn't the truth you wanted to hear, but, but it, it's going to get good. But here's the thing. God is sovereign. He is in control. He numbers our days. He um, directs our steps. He knows the hairs on our head. He knows everything about our lives, and he is in sovereign control. And this is what I want to say. Some of you are like, that's a hard truth. I don't know if I want to believe that. That's not my God. It would be even worse if that weren't true. Because just imagine that maybe the devil is in control. Or just maybe it's chance and it all happens randomly and then there is no purpose and this terrible trial I'm going through, this situation I don't want to be in in my life, that it's just out of order and just happening to me. That's way worse. Thankfully, the, the Bible tells us that God is in control in those situations. He deliberately allows bad things. He doesn't cause the bad things, but he deliberately allows them to happen to us for our good. For our good. And I know that that's a hard truth to hear, but it's so important for us to understand. In Acts chapter 17, in verse 26, we're taught this. From one man, God made all the people of the world. That's everyone. Not, no one excluded. Now they live all over the earth. He decided exactly when they should live, and he decided exactly where they should live. He put you where you are right now. He knows where you are. He knows what you're doing. And you're there for a purpose. You're there for a purpose. So that's why I say in my big idea to bloom where God plants you, even if it's in Babylon. And I say that because we often hear the phrase, bloom where you're planted. It's almost just like happenstance and you just kind of float on the wind or you're carried like that seed and you land somewhere. Oh, No, no, no. God plants you where you are. And I don't want you to miss this because if you miss that, it's really tough. Because when you are in that bad situation, and if you think God doesn't have control in that, man, that's a scary thing. It's a very scary situation to be in. So that's why we need to bloom where God plants us, even in terrible situations, even in Babylon. Now, I want to say this one caveat right here. If you are in a terrible situation, a terrible job, a terrible relationship, and you're like, ah, did God put me here? Yes, but that doesn't mean you're supposed to stay there forever. Now, we'll see here in just a minute that the, Bab the, uh, the Babylonian captivity did not last forever. It was temporary. It was only for a time that God's people were there in exile. It wasn't permanent. It wasn't forever. So this is what I say. If you're in a bad situation and you can get out of it, get out of it. That's biblical. But right now, where you are, some of you are in a bad situation you can't get out of, or, or it's just, you know, you, you know it's temporary. You know it's, it's not forever. That's okay. That's okay. So, that's the one caveat. If you can get out of a bad situation, do it. Nothing's stopping you. You can't say, oh, it's just God's sovereign plan that I'm here to suffer forever. Like, no, it might be temporary. It might be temporary, but God is leading you through that to something better. So God plants you. Now, let's keep looking, because some of you are like, man, this is hard truth. I don't want to hear this. We're getting to the good stuff. We're getting to the good stuff. Um, you know, I was, I was thinking about this. Because it does feel like when we're in those situations, like, why? It doesn't make any sense to me. We can't see any way to put it all together. Like, this doesn't make any sense why I'm here in this terrible situation, this terrible job, this terrible thing. Why? It doesn't feel organized. It doesn't feel anything. And I just want to remind you of the last time you went to a friend's kitchen. 
If you've ever been in there and you're in the kitchen and you're looking for something and you're opening a drawer, where's the forks? Why are there cups in this drawer? And you're looking over here and there's, you can't find the forks anywhere and you're opening everything and you ask your friend who lives there and they're like, oh, it's right there. They know where it is, right? Or you go into the pantry and you're looking around there and you're like, okay, where's the flour? Where's the flour? And you're looking everywhere. The flour in my house is right there on the third shelf, but it's nowhere to be found. I'm looking everywhere. And you ask your friend and they're like, oh, it's right there. And it feels like it doesn't make any sense. Like there's no order. It's all chaos. But that's because you have a different order and the person who owns the house has their order, right? It's in my house too. For those of you who are men, you go in the pantry, you can't find anything. Been there? And I asked my wife, it's right there. Knows exactly where it is. Doesn't seem like it has any order until you talk to the person who knows, who organized it. And that's how it goes with God. We don't see the organization. Sometimes it feels like we never see it. We don't know why this is happening, the purpose behind each scenario and event and situation and time in our lives. But God knows. He is putting it together. He's working it out. He has the organization figured out. And I know you can't find it right now, but I got it. I got it. I'm in control. So let's jump down into verse 4 as we talk about this because there is a purpose to why we are where we are. And in verse 4, we read, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. In verse 5, Build houses, he says, and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. What is he saying to these people? Go live your lives. Live your lives. Get married. Yeah, you know, there's the commands to still marry in the faith. That's very important in the Bible. But marry and have kids. So what he's saying is don't just think about where you are right now, this temporary situation. You need to think more long term. You need to think generations. I did say that this was a temporary time in Israelite history, but do you know how long it lasted? 70 years. That's a long time. For some people, that was their entire lifetime. But this would be kids, grandkids, maybe even great-grandkids would be coming along the scene. So God said, this is temporary. It's not permanent. There's something better for you, but it's going to be a while. So you need to live your life. You need to plant some roots. You've been planted there. I planted you there. So make some roots. Live a life. Have a business. Think generations here. Because do you know what happens when there's times of crises or war or economic hardship? People don't have kids. If you've ever studied you know, sociological history, this happens. You look at it even in the United States. In 2007, there's this big market crash. Nobody had kids. If you look at the trend, the, the, the childbirth rates plummeted during those years. Because when people are like, I don't know if I have any money, I don't want to raise kids because I can't feed them. And then once the economy starts ticking up, all of a sudden the birth rate goes up again. This happens again and again in US history and world history. So God knows this is happening and he's saying, hey, I know this is terrible. This is not where you want to be. This isn't the best situation. But live your lives. You need to put down roots. You need to put down roots here. I'm saying this because we live in a part of Denver that's kind of, there's people coming in and out, right? Some of you are here like, this is my first Sunday and I'm going to be gone next Sunday. You know, that's okay. We're temporary. Some of you work at the airport or you work at different businesses. You're here on a contract and then you'll be gone and you're like, I don't know how long I'm going to be here. So you kind of just step back. But God is saying, hey, I put you here. Put down some roots. You might not be here forever. You might get another job. You may move away. It might be a, a different situation. You, you know, you came here because your kids, your grandkids are here. And, you know, it, it doesn't feel like it's your home. But God is saying, hey, while you're here, while I've planted you here, put down some roots. Have, have family. Have, make some friends. Join a church. Get involved and, and put down some roots while you're here because it may not be where you want to be permanently, but it's where you are right now. It's where you are right now. And, and here's the thing, is that our lives might be 70 years, right? Even where we live right now as human beings is temporary. If we believe in Jesus Christ, this isn't our permanent home. This isn't the kingdom that we're waiting for. So when we think even 70, 80, 90 years, man, oh, that's a long time. It's very temporary when you think of millions upon billions upon trillions of years in eternity with God in heaven. Right? But we still are supposed to make roots while we're here. We're supposed to bloom where you're planted, where God plants you, even if it's in Babylon. 
Let's keep reading in verse 7 because this is what is so interesting. This is why I picked this passage for the series. God says, Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. This is so important. This is so interesting. And I, I think we miss this and we love 2911, but we forget this. God is saying, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you. God has planted you somewhere. You need to bloom. You need to help others. You need to love your neighbors, love your neighborhood. Because when you seek the best of other people around you, when you serve them, when you love them, when you treat them with kindness, when you build up their businesses and you network with these people that maybe you don't even like and you hate, they're on the other end of the political spectrum, you just can't stand these people. But when you seek their best, it's actually going to help you as well. Interesting. Here's the thing about blooms. Who in here has planted some flowers this year? A few of you? A few landscapers worked on landscape. We just were planting some flowers yesterday. Here's the thing about planting flowers. Those of you who have homes or, or you know, apartments and you have a little overlook or whatever, when you plant flowers, you get to enjoy them, right? But who else does? Everyone who sees them. This might be someone driving by on the street, walking by. They can enjoy your flowers. In fact, sometimes some of you guys do this. I've done it. We go on walks and just admire people's landscaping. Wow, you go to a place where people have great, beautiful gardens. You pay big money to get into botanical gardens because you want to see the flowers. You benefit from the blooms, but so does everyone else. And that's why we seek the benefit of others, even if we don't like them. You saw what these Israelites were praying about the Babylonians. And God says, no, 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 seek their welfare. Pray for them and don't just pray that their babies would be killed. That's what God is saying. He's responding to that anger that they have. I don't want to be here. Oh, I hate these people. God says, no, 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 love them. Bless them. Peace is the Hebrew word shalom. And this doesn't just mean the absence of war. It means seeking the best. It's like bringing God's kingdom here on this earth. It's wellness. It's, it's goodness that we are promoting. Their prosperity, even economic prosperity, we should seek to their businesses to grow, to bless them, to purchase goods from the people that are down the street. We're seeking the good and the prosperity and the welfare, some versions translated as, of our city around us, even if we don't want to be here. We're loving our neighbors. We're loving our neighborhood because God plants you there and you're supposed to bloom where God plants you. Some of you are still thinking, well, you know, Matt, it's just, I, I don't get why I personally am in this situation or, or at this location. I, I don't get it personally because it doesn't feel right, doesn't feel good for me. And you're like that young man I talked to this week. Just like, I'm just here taking up space. I don't do any good. Do I really help other people with my, you know, stupid job that I'm working? But here's the thing, and what I told him, and this is a, a, a dumb analogy, but I'm going to uh, give it to you guys as well that I gave it to him. Because sometimes just because we don't see the purpose yet, it doesn't mean there isn't one. So we bought our home a few months ago, and I was just checking out the house, looking at the inspector's list and fixing up a few things. And I was down in my basement looking at everything, trying to learn my, my new house. And there's this pipe that's shut off. And it looks like this pipe's going to nowhere. I couldn't figure out where the pipe is going. It's shut off. It's not doing anything. And I thought, what the heck is this pipe doing here? I don't know. The new house makes no sense to me. There's no purpose to it. But you know what I didn't do? I didn't saw it off. I didn't think, meh, I'm not using it. I don't need it. Let's get rid of it. I left it there. Because a few months later, when spring was coming and I was planting stuff and landscaping, I realized, oh, that's for my sprinkler system. And I turned it on, oh, okay, yeah, it's going out to my sprinkler system. I felt pretty stupid. Some of you were laughing at me probably, but I didn't cut off the pipe just because I didn't know what it was used for yet. It took me a while to discover the purpose, but then when I did, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I know. I'm glad I have this pipe. It's going to be pretty useful here in this hot summer. Here's the thing, in your life, and I told this young man, and I'll tell you guys too, just because you don't know right now what the purpose is, doesn't mean there's no purpose. It may take a while to discover, to, to figure out why, but God has a purpose for your life, right where you are, even if it's in Babylon. Even if it's in Babylon. And here's the amazing thing, you know, we think of these people, yeah, they were in that awful situation, some of us have never experienced anything like that, or never will. But do you know what the Christians in the New Testament were called? Exiles. 
Did you know that? In 1 Peter 2.11, Peter says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. He's saying as Christians, if we believe in Jesus Christ, this is not our home. We belong to another kingdom, another world. We're just passing by. We are exiles, not living where we're supposed to. And it may be for 70, 80, 90, 100 years, but it's only temporary. So we are those exiles. That's why this passage can apply to us. We can look at it in our lives and say, ah, I am an exile. I'm not supposed to be where I am, even if you are in the good job and in the good relationship and where you want to be and everything's peachy keen. This isn't your home. But yes, God planted you here. Yes, put down roots. And yes, bloom. For all of us, this isn't our home. But yet we must bloom because God has planted us here right now in that situation. And we've got to love our neighborhood. We've got to love our neighborhood. So it's amazing because sometimes we don't see those connections, how everything worked. But I heard this story uh, about uh, a man um, named Kien Pham. Kien Pham was Vietnamese. And in fact, as he was a teenager in 1977, when he and his family fled from South Vietnam. They got on boats in the South China Sea and they were there for three weeks before they were rescued. Three weeks just floating there day after night. And they fled to the country, they left their homeland, left the culture they knew, the language they spoke, and they moved to the United States. And when they got here, Kian Pham actually lived here in Colorado and he started attending the University of Colorado in Boulder. And as he was studying, he was trying to learn English because he was trying to learn this culture and this language where He's put now, he doesn't want to be here, but he learns language and he tries to take as many elective classes as he can. And, and he just happens um, to take an elective class um, from a man named Tim Worth. If you've been a Colorado resident for a while, you know who Tim Worth is because he was one of our congressmen and uh, senator for our state. And Tim Worth was teaching this and he talked about a fellowship that he had at the White House when he was younger. Kian Pham heard this and he thought, ah, oh, I want to apply to that fellowship. So he got to know Tim Worth a little bit, and then he applied to the fellowship so that he could work at the White House with the president, and he got rejected. So he applied again, got rejected a second time, but he tried a third time, why not? And he got accepted. So there he was, and this was actually a big moment because eight years after he had fled from Vietnam, he was there, and he got to shake President Reagan's hand in the Oval Office. And there's a big, great photo of this. He was featured on the Today Show telling his story. And he got to know a lot of people, and he got involved in pol politics for this season in the fellowship. And then, you know, he left that, and he started working on his business, and it grew, and he was working on it. But he always kept up a connection with Tim Worth. And Tim Worth, as you, you, you may know, got part of the State Department, and he actually became one of, you know, our global ambassadors. We were working at, in diplomacy around the world. And Kian Pham continued to develop this relationship with this man that he had just happened to hear a lecture from, Right? And he got together with him. I think they were sharing dinner one night. And he just asked him, he said, you know, what are you guys doing? What is the State Department doing to free the hundreds and thousands of political prisoners still in Vietnam? It's been 30 years. Tim Worth says, you know, we've been trying. We've been working on it. But we're making no headway. Nothing's happening. We just have terrible contacts in Vietnam. And we can't get them to release any prisoners. So Kian Pham says, well, I know that culture. I know some people there. I speak that language. Let me try. I say, go ahead. We're not going anywhere. So Kian Pham calls some of his contacts and, and gets a touch with them and he talks with them and he finally persuades them and convinces them to release one prisoner. And they release one guy. So Kian Pham goes to the ambassador and he says, you need to make a huge deal about this. You need to make a huge press conference and let everybody know about it. And the ambassador's like, no, 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 we don't do that. It was just one prisoner, not a big deal, we, we don't do that. And he says, no, 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 you've got to do it. So they did. Big press conference, they invite everyone there, they tell the story about the one prisoner that the Vietnamese government has let go. The Vietnamese liked that. They were excited. So a few weeks later, uh, Pham goes back and he says, hey, could you guys release a second prisoner? And they say, okay. They release a second one. They do the same thing, a huge press conference, invite everyone, tell everyone the great story about how great the Vietnamese government is being releasing these prisoners. Well, then they do the next thing every two to three weeks for an entire year. That was 1998. Gian Pham, um, at the end of that year, and seeing the success that they've had releasing one prisoner at a time, went to the government and he says, hey, you know, the turn of the century is coming. Y2K. This is like the year of Jubilee. Why don't you, instead of just releasing one prisoner at a time, release all of them? 
all 4,000 prisoners that you still have. It will be huge. It will be great for your country. People will love you. So they did it. They released all 4,000. What I loved about this story when I heard it was the whole time that he was doing this, uh, helping these people's lives, doing something great, he was only thinking of one person. He had thought about this man uh, when he was floating there in the South China Sea because he was the one person in his family who didn't make it out. He thought about him as he shook President Reagan's hand, as he made this connection with Tim Worth, as he got involved in all this stuff. He was thinking of one man, and he was the 4,000th prisoner that was released, and it was his uncle. He had put in that situation, he had the relationship, he was thinking of one person, but he ended up doing a great good for so many people. And God put him in that situation, and he puts us in the situation that we are in. It doesn't make sense. Why am I in this? I don't want to be here. This isn't where I want to be. But God puts us in there, even through the hardship, to bring about great good. And we need to just start with those simple things that we can do. We are the exiles here. But God has planted us here, and we've got to bloom. We've got to bloom. And we can do this as individuals. We can do this as individuals. I don't care what your political stance is or what you think about him, but Jack Phillips um, in Lakewood, the owner of the, the Masterpiece Bake Shop, which is infamous, right, um, for their refusal, and the Supreme Court came down. Well, a few weeks ago, there was a whole bunch of people protesting out in front of their bakery, right? Because he didn't refuse to serve a, a homosexual couple. And you can disagree with his stance, and you say, I would do it, I would do it, but, but that's not the point. What he did, I had a friend that went by that day, as hundreds of people were protesting. Do you know what Jack Phillips did? He baked everybody cookies and gave them away for free. He loved people that hated him on the other end of the political spectrum, but he loved them. We as individuals can do that, even if we're around those people we don't like or that don't like us. We've got to love other individuals, and we can do this as a church as well. You know, it's going to start by us loving our neighbors in our neighborhood, but we're going to do it as a church. We're going to do it as a church. I heard about a church in West Texas, First Baptist Church of West Texas. Do you remember a few years ago when um, West Texas had that terrible fertilizer accident? The fertilizer plant blew up. 15 people were killed. Terrible thing that happened. Tons of damage. Well, this pastor there, um, his name is uh, John Crowder. And as the pastor, he said, okay, we've got to mobilize. We know the people, so as all these aid organizations were coming in, they connected people, they got them into the right place, they got all the churches rallied together to serve the people that were hurt and hurting and all the people that were affected by the tragic attack. And, and then he realized, hey, we've got to have a rally to get more people excited about this. So their church was averaging about like 175 people at the time, pretty small church. Um, but they said, hey, let's have a rally. So they went out on the lawn and they invited everyone and 500 people showed up. And that day... Um, he preached a message, and he basically said, yeah, this is terrible what has happened, but God is bigger. And it was picked up by the media, and it even got to the president, and President Obama quoted this pastor saying that God is bigger. And when that happened, tons of people began to hear about this church and, and this, that was doing so many good things. And from that day forward, they were packed in their church. And in an interview, uh, this pastor said, you know, I have baptized and led more people to Christ over the last three years than I had in 20 years of ministry before that. Because they were out loving their neighborhood. They were there. God had put them in that terrible situation to do good. And I want us to be a church who does that too. I want us to be a church who sees the needs around us, that helps people, that loves where, right where we are in our neighborhood. Here in Stapleton, North Aurora, Park Hill, wherever you guys are coming from. We, we are here and we're going to serve people. We're going to love people, and, and we're going to make a huge impact. That's why we're doing this Community Impact Day coming up. Did you hear about it? Community Impact Day. We're partnering with a great organization to paint some people's houses. This is maybe a little thing, but I want us all to mobilize. This is like a church-wide thing. This isn't like, oh, I like to paint. I'll do that. No, no, no. This is everybody. Even if you can't physically do it, we can get a job for you. Okay? We want everybody to join us on August 18th. We're going to be trying to do this at least once a year, that we get everyone mobilized. And, and as we see even bigger needs, we're going to try to tackle those so that we can be a church that blooms where God planted us. We can bloom where God planted us. And I hope that you guys are getting excited about this. You mark your connection cards. You clear your calendar for this day because it's going to be awesome because God has planted us in a unique situation. We still don't know maybe all the purposes of why, but I think God can do amazing things in us 
and through us as we seek the peace and prosperity of our city. As we seek to bloom and serve and love those people who are around us that are in need. Um, so I want to give you a, a, another homework assignment. And then we're going to do something unique. Um, so last week, if you were here, I gave you a, a really tough homework assignment. Does anybody remember what it was? To go meet your neighbors. I gave you this little chart in your bulletin. There's one again this week. Just to learn their names. Some of you already knew them and you could write them down. But I want you to think of all the houses or apartments around you, wherever you live. Just think of the people that live around you and write down their names. Get to know them. I talked to one guy last week and he said, Matt, for the first time I waved at my neighbor. Awesome. Good first step. Now let's get to know their names. But here's the homework assignment today. There's a second step. I want you to start praying for your neighbor. Perhaps you already know how you could be praying for them, or you, or you can guess. But I want you to start praying for those people. And that's why I put that chart in there again, so you can put their names and maybe go back a second time and say, how can I pray for you? And start praying for those people that live around you. So that's your homework assignment for this week. But here's the next thing I want us to do. Well, that passage said that we need to pray for our city, right? We need to pray for them. So I want us to pray. Seems pretty simple, right? So we're going to do something maybe a little unique, but we're going to have the band come up and they're going to be playing some music and we're going to be praying for our city. Now I've just picked several different things that we can be praying for our city for and we're going to put them up on the screen for maybe 30 seconds and I want you where you're sitting to just pray for these different items, for these different people, for these situations and we as a church are going to be praying for our city. Now some of you live in different cities, some of you are, you know, uh, in Aurora or up in um, Brighton or wherever, Englewood, wherever you're coming from, you can pray for your city. But since we here as a church are in Denver, we're going to be praying primarily for Denver. Got it? And what I want you to do is pray. So some of you are uncomfortable to pray out loud. That's fine. Pray silently. But if you're up for it, just say your prayer out loud, okay? We're all going to be praying in here, and God hears our prayers. So whether it's silently or loud, we're just going to be praying for these different things. You guys in? Because here's, here's the amazing thing that, that I want us to know, as, as the band's still coming up, um, is that we see that God had this chosen people in the Old Testament, these Israelites. They weren't where they wanted to be, but God protected them. But the amazing thing is that God's plan always was for all of the nations. He started with one nation. But he wanted all nations. Even he told Abraham at the very beginning, through you I will bless all the nations. And we know that that came to pass through Jesus Christ, who died for all people, all nations, all ethnicities, all races, all origins. And he, he died for all those people. So that's why we pray for all the people. We have all these nations among us, all these people living near us. We're going to pray for our city. We're exiles here. It's not our kingdom. But we're going to bloom where God plants us, even if it's in Babylon. Would you close your eyes with me?